It's the Maho Indie Spotlight with Evan's Remains. What a beautiful game, it's called Evan's Remains. Puzzle platforming really is fun. Hello everybody and welcome to another fantastic edition of Maho Indie Spotlight. It's me, Cody, and with me today is Brandon. Hello everybody. And also Robin. I have been playing too much this Gaia 5 lately. <laughs> Great. We're going to be talking about a different game today. We have a special guest on. His name is Matthias. He is the developer of the game Evans Remains, currently on Kickstarter. Hi, everybody. It's, it's really nice to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so can you briefly explain what Evans Remains is? Uh, okay, yeah. Evans Remains, it's a weird combination between a puzzle platforming game and sort of like... A visual novel, but you don't really have choices. It's just a linear story, but it has this style of showing the portrait of the characters and that kind of. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of text, so that's why I, I use the excuse and call it with visual novel elements, although it's not really a visual novel, but I think you, you get my point. It's really inspired by games like Ghost Trick or Ace Attorney, where I think the, the mystery, like, you want to know more, that's like the thing that makes you want to, to keep playing, to see what is this about. Gotcha. And mm. no, that's pretty on point with, and I'm sure we'll get into it as far as what the demo contained. But yeah, by the end of it, I was just like, there are like 900 plot threads that are now open. I need to know <laughs> what's coming next. So. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's what I love most about these kind of games. And I think I did like hard work on trying to mimic that but in my own style so try to make that but in my game yeah definitely right yeah so in the demo that it's available on the kickstarter page you play as a girl named dysis who is on a yeah. mysterious island <laughs> and uh she's searching for her boy evan who left her a note and uh, she was specifically requested by evan to go find him at this island uh, she yeah. has her companion, Nicola, communicating with her through some kind of, like, subspace picture thing that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And they meet a guy named Clover there who is uh, taking notes about the island, but we don't learn too much more about him in the demo. Yeah. You want to know more about he, uh, him or, or what? I mean, if you're, if you're willing to kind of drop anything, sure, because there's, I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. And, like, just in general, one of the overarching themes that I really enjoyed was just that uh, everything was just kind of explained away with rule of cool. It's like, oh, no, Evan's just this genius inventor. I mean, you got you got these communicators that show full body. You got a, a bedroom subspace that you just kind of, like, hop into. <laughs> There's a <laughs> lot of really cool inventions, and they're just like, yeah, hey, Evan's, Evan's genius inventor. It's fine. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. All right, I can do that. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the reasons is it's not like that, because when I started the game, I had this really common mistake that I think most of writers or, or game dev or anyone makes, is that you try to explain everything, yep. and you, you treat the player or the, the viewer like it's dumb and just want to answer all of their questions at once. So one of the big corrections I tried to make was like, was like okay, let me just not answer everything and like I will answer it but but like in a, a slower pace and I just didn't want this thing about characters explaining things all the time because it's something that already happens I think in the game so I wanted to like make it as little as possible. And that makes sense. Yeah, I really like that philosophy, especially with the way the characters do it. It all makes sense to them. They aren't surprised by anything they're seeing. Like, when Dysis opens her magical bedroom and goes into it, like, I thought that was really cool. She's like, oh, I guess time for bed, boop, and then goes in. <laughs> um, yesterday, I was watching an old cartoon called Darkwing Duck with a friend, and it's about basically Disney's version of Batman. He just kind of, like, lives in an area and has wacky gadgets and, like, fights crime, but he's really bad at it. And they never explain how he ends up with his lair or all this technology. Like, did he invent it? Is he just rich and smart? Nope, they, they don't need to explain it because you don't care. You just like seeing him shoot butter out of a gun to butter his toast. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. that's kind of the thing too because once she's like, all right, well, I guess it's time for bed. I'm like, are, 
are, are you just gonna make camp on this island what what do you even have girl and then she's like boop uh, here's a full bedroom and i was like oh well that was unexpected that's cool though <laughs> i wish i had one of these right <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely I want to talk about the the puzzle platforming a bit too cuz I really like it's it's intuitive once you learn how it works and I thought like it was I've never seen that kind of of puzzle style before. I mean people do jumping on platforms but like making the platforms themselves the puzzle is kind of cool where they'll they'll disappear when you jump off of them but you can like switch them on and off. How'd you come up with that? I think I came up with that by kind of of mistake because I started the game like knowing what to do, but at the same time not really knowing what to do. It was like a combination of both. And I knew I wanted to make puzzles, but I wanted to make like logical puzzles. I I remember at that time I was playing a lot of The Witness and I got really inspired by, by it. So I kind of thought what it would be like to take that kind of logic resolution thing, but mixing it with, with platforms. And that's why like the game has... All the like the puzzle sections looks like panels, like they are all big panels. So mm -hmm. um, I think I basically take the witness on platforms and threw it there, and that's what it came. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I first came across the puzzles, and there was like some that were pushed in and some that were out, and I jumped on the thing and it switched them. My initial thought was like, oh, this is like a timed thing. And because I play, as far as platformers go, I play like a lot of Mega Man games. And like all of them have like the blocks that appear and disappear. And you've got to like, <laughs> you know, memorize the order and then jump based on the timing. So I was like, all right, let's go. And I jumped. And then the platform beneath me disappeared. And then the next one didn't appear. And I was like, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, after I felt like at the second puzzle, like I, I kind of brute forced my way through the first one at the second one. Then I was like, oh, that's how this works. OK. And then at that point, it was it was pretty cool to, to kind of see like sh seeing the layout and being like, OK, this is what I need to do to solve it. Let's let's get started. And having like this plan of attack every time was was really neat that I could identify and then solve the puzzle mentally before actually completing it. <laughs> that's amazing yeah i think we are really used to in platformer games we are really used to that the things are always by time but mm -hmm. I, I never i never wanted time to be a, a difficulty factor because like i want to leave player like like take your time to do this i'm not gonna pressure you it's kind of my philosophy i don't know no it makes sense and it and it works too because the at least with the narrative that we've gotten so far i mean if there's a lot of you know technological innovation you would kind of think that the people that were here prior may have been more you know logic based so something that would rely on that sort of like timing and needing to do all that to get past the stuff would kind of be irrelevant so having it be much more thought focused also plays into the narrative that we've uh, we've seen so far too yeah sure 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 Right, and I noticed that you, you got like a special mention as being like one of the best games for families at a festival you went to, and I think that the, the playstyle really supports that, because it doesn't seem like you're going for a high-impact Mega Man sort of game, you know? This is something that anyone from ages 4 to 104 could pick up and figure out and enjoy. Yeah, I remember when I was nominated for that prize, I kind of felt a little bit afraid because the game looks really childish and like yeah sure you can uh, a little boy can play this but what it gets me kind of scared is that going near the end of the game it gets like a little bit darker mm -hmm. so i want to make sure that i put that teen rating or whatever because right <laughs> the game looks really um, I don't know. I always love the thing, this uh, thing about the Mother series that it looks really childish, the visuals, but I wouldn't define them as a game for kids, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And one of the things, too, especially, you know, like comparing it to the Mother series and everything, a like someone who's like 10 to 12 that's playing it could still get through it and they might still not understand the full impact of everything that's being said, but they can still play it and enjoy it. So I don't think you really need to worry too much because even if you have younger audiences playing, even if it does get darker, they may still not understand the full impact of everything that's coming across, and they're just enjoying the platforming and that you know the gameplay and that sort of thing. So I don't think you'll need to worry too much about that, but that's just my my insight. 
the, the kids yeah. these days, they don't read. They just don't read. <laughs> <laughs> they just push yeah, the buttons awesome. and make the thing happen. They push that's the awesome. buttons and yeah. play the Fortnite and dance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you don't need to worry then. Okay. <laughs> But no, I was I was gonna actually ask that too, especially given that you you know listed Danganronpa as a potential like in source of inspiration. I'm like, there's got to be some something weird's gonna be coming down the pipe here eventually. You don't you don't say you like Danganronpa and then make a cutesy game. There's that that doesn't yeah. happen. <laughs> yeah, there's always a weird shit that happens at the end. <laughs> okay, cool. I always loved the Danganronpa series a lot. Like when my friend first showed me the first one. I was like, how is the first time I even heard of this? You know, like, <laughs> right? I was so fascinated by, by that game. It was so weird, so different from anything I played before. And I remember, I think I was in, in secondary school back then. I had school the other day, but I couldn't sleep because I was playing the game. I wanted to know what was going to happen next. I was so hooked <laughs> to what was going on. And the final part of the, the Danganronpa 1... That feeling just stuck with me for so many years, and I always thought, like, I want to try to cause that as well in the player. It was, I don't know, it was, like, really powerful to me. Yeah, mm. we've talked about that a couple times on the show, where, like, there's a video game that just, it captures something in you, and, and it just makes you love video games. Um, yeah. And that could be, like, you know... Pokemon, you know, if Pokemon is someone's first game and, you know, they choose a starter and they're going on this grand adventure, you know, I had a, a similar feeling like that. Or like with Final Fantasy Tactics, like mm -hmm. all the mechanics and how they interact and how rewarding it is to figure those out, you know, e everyone has that game that they yeah. played and they went, you know what, video games are awesome. <laughs> yeah, they are. They truly are. Yeah. Yeah. So was Rumpa the main inspiration for this? I think kind of because it was Danganronpa, but it was a Saturnia as well, and it was a Yumeniki as well. It, I would think that the the four main inspirations were Danganronpa, a Saturnia, Ghost Trick, and Yumeniki. I don't know how to describe it because I wasn't just looking at one game to take inspiration from, but sure. from the start I was always thinking about the Danganronpa style. And although it's a very different game, it's a puzzle platformer and there's no murder to solve. I wanted to, I don't know, to, to carry that same, uh, what was going on here. I, there are so many questions. I, I mean, that yeah. kind of thing. And with those, mm -hmm. I mean, with all the games that you mentioned, even though they are very different and even different from Evan's Remains, all of them have that same, I mean, sort of storytelling style where they don't tell you what's going on. They, they give you pieces you can make assumptions, you can kind of guess, but until like the story completes, you don't actually get to see everything. So I can definitely see where your storytelling elements are coming from, from uh, from those other games. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly that. Yeah. Oh, it's just like Dark mm. Souls then. <laughs> 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 because everything is Dark Souls, boys and girls. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Motherfucker, can't believe they're releasing. Uh, Dark Souls, but the Iron Throne now. Uh, oh, Elden Ring? <laughs> yeah. yeah, whatever it is. I don't yeah. know. I am too burned out for from Dark Souls. Jeez. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I tried Dark Souls uh, for the first time, like, some weeks before. And I don't know. I, I didn't... I thought I would connect with the game, and I would love it, because I know myself. I know what kind of games I would, like, potentially like. But it didn't happen, and I don't know why. Yeah, I, I very much enjoy dark, hard, gritty resource management games with environmental storytelling, which is Dark Souls. That's like what yeah. the game is, but I just I could not click with the gameplay. It, it is yeah. super punishing. Like, I went through the depths, which I guess is the worst area of the game, and it's why everybody skips it. But I went through it anyway because I'm a stubborn mule. And then, <laughs> and then after that, you go into Blight Town, which is the worst thing imaginable, and I beat Quayleg, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm good. I've suffered enough. And then, <laughs> and then my my friend who's beaten basically every soul's like he's like, but Cody, you haven't gotten to Snorlax and Pikachu yet, <laughs> which is Ornstein and Smog. It's a famous fight in that one. And yep, yep, it is. Yeah, no, I've already had my soul crushed enough. Thanks. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Again, like going back to difficulty, you know, Dark Souls has this very high barrier to entry, and there's a lot of you know persistence and a little bit of luck required. Whereas 
I think for, for Mass Appeal's sake, you know, the, the kind of game you're making, like I was saying earlier, anybody can just pick this up and play it and figure it out. And I think that, you know, we need those games as much as we need these, these ultra-hardcore challenges like Dark Souls. Yep. Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. one of the things, too, and it's something we've talked about before on other, on other casts, is that the... And with a puzzle platform, you're a little bit more limited in that respect. But, like, getting to play the game how you want to play it is is very powerful to people. Um, so having it be, be super hard makes it so that you're pigeonholed into playing it a certain way so that you can actually play the game that way. But something that's a little bit more open and free um, kind of offers that. So, I mean, I prefer games that I can sit and play rather than have to play the same scene over and over and over again to get past it. I'm not eight anymore. I don't have time to waste hours on an NES game. So. <laughs> what, you don't like dying to the same pit, you know, over and over and over again? No, if I did, I'd be a speedrunner. <laughs> <laughs> Shoutouts to GDQ. <laughs> no, going back to that, yeah, like the original NES Castlevania, if you're playing it properly, you can beat it in like 45 minutes. But who really has? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, some speedrunners, because one guy I watch has, like, the world record for Ninja Gaiden, and it's like, he beats it in, like, sub-12 minutes or something, and I'm like, that game took me, like, days to beat yeah. when I was a kid. Yeah. This is bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, I was watching the other day, like, um, the speed, um, I think the world record for Breath of the Wild, and it was, like, so funny and so amazing, and I I couldn't believe that there, there was a human behind that. Because mm. they're so good, they're so good at all of their timing and everything. It's it's unreal some of the stuff they yeah, do. It, it was yeah, unbelievable. yeah. Most of that's like practice or something. And uh, like spoilers for when we record. I think it's going on right now. I think it's this week. AGDQ or something or SGDQ. Which Some, one was it? Summer games done quick. I'm watching it right now as we speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, it's going on right now. Where did the, the character ideas come from? Because, like, Nikola, okay, scientist, Nikola Tesla, cool. But, like, <laughs> I've, I've never heard the name Dysus before. Where'd you get that? Um, I actually went to Google and, and Google uh, <laughs> girl names. And I picked one that wasn't too cliche. And I, and I, and I found Dysus and I thought, oh, that sounds really cool. And <laughs> I just picked that. <laughs> I mean, it works. It's it's definitely got like an its own mysterious element to it. So, yeah, I think I wanted at least Dice is because Clover is a really common name, I think, for a character. But I wanted at least Dice is to to feel somewhat different. I thought of of the main character as a girl from the start because I don't know. I, I think uh, video game needs more female uh, main characters. Yeah, I can get behind that. The the, the genre has been kind of male dominated for for main characters for years um yeah and and now a lot of indie games are having that and it's very nice to see that diversity uh in, in different types of main characters so i'm definitely in, agree in agreement with that yeah yeah because it's usually been a dude or you can choose but it's it's hardly ever been like a female lead because you have like these giant studios going nah that's not gonna sell and the the, the worst thing about like that studio mentality is generally they're they're just playing it safe, you know. Yep. They know that having a white dude with a gun on the cover is gonna sell until it doesn't. <laughs> and yeah. I hate that, and I hate that. We're, we're at that point where it doesn't. Yeah. For example, I I wanted to try the the Metal Gear series for so long, but just the mm -hmm. fact that the main character is a typical uh, muscular guy with uh, a gun, it was like a a letdown. I don't know. I I don't like it because. It has been so common through these years to have like the typical muscular macho guy um, mm -hmm. with deep voice and everything. <laughs> oh man, y you might like two more because Kojima himself didn't like making that <laughs> game, and two is a deconstruction of everything that he didn't like about one, including introducing Raiden as the main character, who is not a gravelly voiced hero. You know? Yeah, he is instead an anime boy hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's literally like giving everybody their self insert hero in two and calling them out on their nonsense. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Also, the bosses are cool because they have anime powers. 
<laughs> yeah, like, like Metal Gear Solid, it's kind of like Batman in the sense that, like the main character is the least interesting person. Like Snake is just your vehicle to meet all the really cool people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. Oh boy. Oh, uh, so, something we haven't tackled yet. Your pixel art is gorgeous. How long have you oh, been doing yes. that? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, but I have to, like, I started the game drawing everything myself, but recently. I had a colleague, a really amazing pixel art, uh, a lot better than, than myself, that has been helping me. He, for example, like the, all the little animations that you see now on the demo were made by him, not me. Oh, okay. So, but if you try an early version of the game, like a few months prior, you're going to see the animations that were made by me and weren't that great. So... <laughs> So yeah, now the game looks a lot prettier than than it used to. But yeah, like 90% of the pixel art was made by me. I always draw since I was a kid, but I started doing pixel art as soon as I started making games. But I don't want to be a pixel artist or an artist anymore. I think I'm like, right now I'm transitioning to being more of a programmer because Making art is too hard, and I don't want to make <laughs> art. I want to make games, and to make games, you need to know more about programming than you need to know about art. I don't know if that that's makes true. sense. No, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's that's kind of one of the, the 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 nice things, at least. I mean, coming back to our roots in RPG Maker, is you've got the like the default assets to use, so your game can still look okay even if you can't art. So it does pull in a lot of folks that. Uh, that, that are more programmer based, but then you also got the other subsection where they don't deal with any of the programming stuff and they just make everything really pretty. And I just kind of in the middle, I mean like, well, I can program, but I can't art anything yeah. ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, I, I if you want to be in game dev, programming is definitely going to be more important than, uh, than being able to draw for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing that you can always like, it has a lot less chances to broke everything. I mean, you can change art to the last day of development, but you can't change like a lot of system and, and code. That's, That's more likely to 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 blow up. I, I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yeah. That's fair, but no, I mean, it, it, even regardless, the pixel art in that game is is fantastic. Idle animations and everything else aside, so both of you did a fantastic job. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Really glad you like it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of the important things that when you asked me before, like, how do you do to stand out being from Argentina and all that, I always thought that Event Remains would be, like, the only game that, like, I like to imagine all the games I'm going to be making from the future. And this one is the only one that's going to look this pretty because <laughs> when no one... When no one knows you, and the only way to to make people uh, play your game or or even be slightly interested in playing is making it as beautiful as you can. Other mm -hmm. otherwise, they're not gonna play it because if you're just a nobody, I mean, it's a lot difficult if your game doesn't look pretty. That is true. Yeah, I think that's that's yeah. what was like my strategy. Yeah, that is true. It's like another RPG problem where. Everyone uses the default art, so now no one really cares for the default art. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It just looks like every other project, you know, at a certain point. But having been on, like, Tumblr and seeing their RPG Maker community, yeah, screenshots do so much heavy lifting when you're a new dev starting out. Because, yeah, like, people's first impression is not the audio. It's not the voice acting. It's yeah. not the music. It's not the gameplay. They see a it's screenshot. It's not the programming either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, it's the first contact they have, and in that split second, they decide if they are interested in playing it or not. So, Absolutely. It's the same, too. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, predating things like games, you know, you have books mm -hmm. and, you know, all that sort of thing. And you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but that's what happens. If the, yeah. if the cover <laughs> art is interesting, it grabs you and you pick it up and then you read the back and you're like, oh, OK. This is cool. But if the cover art itself, if the, the screenshot, as it were, doesn't capture your interest, you never even look at it. Exactly. Yeah. That's just how it works, sadly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, you did grab the attention of an American publisher, Whitethorn Digital. So how'd you feel when that happened? Well, it was kind of crazy because <laughs> want me to like tell you the, the, the short story. Yeah, so, go for it. So, as much yeah. as you want. 
Okay. <laughs> so yeah, basically all my last year I built the demo part uh, during my free time outside work and everything and during weekends. And so I finished, uh, it was the demo basically. I went to an event here in Argentina that is like the GDC, but from Argentina is a lot uh, smaller and mm -hmm. It gets visitors like from the U.S. Like for example, last year was like uh, Raw Fury or that kind of big publishers. Hmm. And I went there and I pitched the game um, to mostly all of the publishers. And of course, no one uh, was interested in. No one replied to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. So. And I was kind of really burnt out uh, because it was like a whole year making uh, this this stuff by myself. During that time, I had like no help at all. Right now, I'm having help, but uh, back there, I didn't. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of just uh, thinking, you know, it's just it doesn't work. It. Let's just start another project, like with all the things I learned here, and let's make it better. This time, um, and I was about to. I remember I had like uh, I have a uh, a blog on Tumblr from the game, mm -hmm. and I remember I wrote like a chunk, a big chunk of text, like to the like the the really few people that were interested in the game. I prepared this big text that said like, "Hey guys, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to continue this dream game because I'm too stressed. <laughs> 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 so sorry, but I'm I'm going." Um, so, but I didn't, I didn't click on the, um, the, the publish button. I just waited for the next day. And next day I woke up and I, I checked the Facebook page from the game and some guy called Matthew White wrote me and he said he was, they were a publisher and he encountered the game on each and he said he was interested in making the, um, like publish the game and everything, put into consoles. And they offered me doing the Kickstarter and I said to him, you know, this all this sounds really nice, but I have a full time work. I I can like keep working on this during my free time. I mean, if I could get some funding to finish this thing, it would it would be much easier. So then he said, okay, we can give you some money, and we can like the budget. I said to him didn't sound like too much for him. So he said, okay, we can like up from that to you from us and the other half we can get it through the kickstarter so we'll make it work he he said that to me i agreed so then i continued working on the game till today that's the story <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome though we're just like uh, well i guess i guess i'm done this doesn't work i'm just gonna sleep on it and then boom the next day <laughs> it, all, it all just comes comes into place. That's that's like storybook right there. Yeah, it, it's it was like a, a, th those days were like a movie. It was like this is just uh, <laughs> strange, like things don't usually work like this. Uh, what is happening? <laughs> right as he was about to give up, a thread of hope emerged. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, oh boy, gosh. offering to to publish it to consoles and stuff. That's pretty cool because for them. All the front end is, hey, you know, we'll represent you. We want to get this game made, and if you can get it finished and maybe earn some money on Kickstarter, great. Yeah, it's that, that, that was really cool. And I noticed how different it is when you have someone else other than you that believes in the thing. It makes so much of a difference. Right. Because when you're just yourself, even though sometimes your friends tell you, yeah, I like your game, it's really nice, I don't know. But when you really have, like, this, like, now I have, like, Wythorn and the Kickstarter, and there's been a lot of people that have been lately coming up and, and saying really nice things, and it really makes a difference because you feel like you're not alone anymore. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, a friend's word, you kind of still understand that it's filtered through them being a friend, but like when a complete stranger comes out and says it, that's, that's totally different. Yeah, it really is. Friends are great, but they also, they do that. It's, yeah, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for exactly. someone, who, but yeah, but for someone who understands what you're trying to do and and how you're doing what you're doing, like it, it makes all the difference in the world sometimes. Yeah. Uh, did you have any any cool stretch goals in mind for Evans Remains? Not really, because I'm gonna be honest with you. Uh, only, I thought that that the Kickstarter wouldn't be successful because uh, I don't know. It, like the other day. A baker from five hundred dollars uh, just canceled their tier, and uh, the Kickstarter just went backwards. 
mm. and I was like started to lose my shit because <laughs> and, and I was like this this last few days I mean this whole month is killing me because for example the other day I sent like 30 emails and no one was answered and I'm I'm always like hey please uh, look my kickstart I'm like all the time trying to get people know about the the thing and it's like you go and and let 500 people know and just like five of them come back and check on the kickstarter and and make it so it's i'm having a hard time like explaining about what i'm trying to say it's like it's hard you know like right. uh, you have to make people care so i wasn't really sure that we were going to reach the goal but lately it had like a a little peak again so now it's it has passed the middle so i'm kind of recovering my hopes so sure. i think i i'll start to think about the stretch goals yeah but i didn't yet <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah because I, I know like it's it's common to have stretch goals just in case your your thing goes over it encourages people to still donate after it hits the mark but it sounds like you're still in that that maelstrom with like oh my god are the you know this money am i gonna get it oh no I'm exactly in that part, so that that's why I, I didn't even think about <laughs> stretch <goal. laughs> Oh my god. Yeah, that's got to be so freaking stressful, because, like, it, your your fate is ostensibly in these other people's hands. Like, <laughs> like how do I get you to notice? How do I get you to give me your money? God! <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, that, that's pretty tough, yeah, because there's so many awful Kickstarter stories nowadays. Like, out of like maybe the, the, the one tenth of them being really good, a lot of them are terrible. Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm really sad about Mighty Number no. Nine or <laughs> Mighty Number no. Two, whichever it was, <laughs> and uh, ukulele, I guess. Uh, but I guess it's all right because the games they were trying to trying to make the originals did, came back better now. That's true. I guess it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it got really sad. Sad rated over the years and i didn't think it was that much work i mean when the publisher said we're gonna make a kickstarter i was like yeah sure uh, uh, how hard could that be and i thought <laughs> oh my fucking god right I, I i don't know i it's it's hard you know making a, a crowdfunding uh, i overestimated but it's a lot harder than i thought Kind of like we're going back to, I mean, talking about just with, you know, screenshots capturing people's attention, you've got to have a Kickstarter that is informative enough to, like, draw people in and make them interested in your game. But at the same time, don't you can't reveal too much about your game because you don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. So you, you, ha you walk this really tenuous line. And um, I mean, j just for an example, I'm on a team, a dev team for a visual novel, and we're getting closer crossing fingers to coming up on, you know, social medias and that sort of thing here shortly. So yeah. like having to like think ahead and like, okay, this is how I need to phrase everything. And then just constantly doubting myself and second guessing myself on how I'm presenting this information, what I'm saying, mm -hmm. does this come across correctly? So I can't even imagine like a whole Kickstarter having to do that, let alone 160 character tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Hey, uh, Brandon, he here's a pro tip. You you put that frog girl on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, probably. People love Sue you, so they'll like other frog girls. <laughs> oh, boy. We won't try and stress you out too much, Matthias, since this is your first interview. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up pretty soon here. How can people reach you? How can people find you and learn more about Evan's Remains? Following me on Twitter is more than enough because I think that's uh, the, the social media that I'm most active and I'm always posting and checking the, the campaign if, if the people is interested. All right. So you all heard follow this man and give him your money. <laughs> I mean, once rent and everything comes up for next month, I'm going to be I'm gonna be throwing some money at it. So, yeah, yeah. Yes. Follow him and throw him your money, but not in a creepy way. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Is there uh, any any cute little nuggets of information you can drop about Evan's remains? You know, just sort of like an exclusive little spoiler or. Um. Hmm. Let, okay. Uh, mm. It was the mayflies all along. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they were actually aliens. Okay. I. I don't know if if this is kind of of what you, you you were meaning but one of the characters is going to die only one 
Mm. Only one. Only one. Are we going to have a class trial to determine how they die? <laughs> <laughs> we should. <laughs> Versus the jury of mayflies. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> but no, that's that's interesting. I like I, I kind of figured like one like I said once once I had seen that Nangan was a was an inspiration. I figured something dark was gonna happen. So that that suspicion has been confirmed at least. So that that works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh jeez. All right, well, Matthias, thank you so much for coming on the program. We'll have this up uh, as soon as we can so we can help you get more Kickstarter bucks. Yeah, absolutely. Hey. We'll let you know when it's posted, the finished video, because, like, Cody Cody usually takes, like, uh, half a month to edit these things. <laughs> I'm a better man than that, please. <laughs> oh, boy. Nah, no, don't even worry. Um, I wanted to say uh, thanks to you guys to I don't know to invite me. I had a really good time, and I don't know. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, you're all amazing. You're all really nice people. Keep your your podcast. I'm gonna check your channel. I promise, uh, because I saw you interviewed some people that I'm really interested about. So I'm gonna definitely check it out. Oh, cool. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, this then concludes our Maho Indie Spotlight. Uh, this has been Cody. We'll see y'all next time. This is Brandon. We'll see you in the next video. This is uh, Blue Sky Robin. I guess we're going to teleport through the island now. <laughs> Actually, no, fuck that. I'm going to go play some more Disgaea 5. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> see you later, bud. Jump on the platforms, dude! <laughs>